Well, hey, Central family, good morning, and hello to those of you joining us online. My name is Tiffany, and I'm so honored to be sharing with you this morning on Palm Sunday. But first, I want to kick off with a little game, so just go with me. How many of you have played Would You Rather? Right, okay, well, we're going to play Would You Rather. So first question, raise your hand. Would you rather hold a baby chick or a baby bunny? Raise your hand, baby, baby chick. All right few of you. How many of you baby bunny? Yeah, guess what? You get to do both next week. Shameless Easter plug. Next Sunday, it's going to be incredible. I'm telling you what. Next question. Would you rather eat Cadbury eggs or Reese's peanut butter cup eggs? What, what would you pick? Cadbury eggs. Who are my Cadbury people? Yes, I love Cadbury eggs. They're my favorite. Um, Reese's peanut butter cups. No judgment if you like that. That's cool. So what else? I like that too. All right, okay, who, next one, how many of you guys would you rather eat out or eat at home? Eat out, eat at home. All right, all the mamas that need cooking breaks are like, eat out. All right, next one, how many of you guys, classic Easter, Easter treat, how many of you would rather eat peeps or eat jelly beans? Peeps, who are my peeps people? Who's jelly beans? All right. Hey, you're among friends. We're all imperfect people in progress. You can like what you want to like and still be in a safe place to explore the claims of Christ. We're glad you're here. Well, you know what? Today we're going to be asking ourselves this very question in light of the Palm Sunday scripture we're going to be exploring. Would you rather? Would you rather be an observer or a participant? And what does that look like for how we live our lives? So we're going to unpack the word of God today, and I'm so excited for what he has for us. But first, I would like to have you join me in giving a huge, warm, central welcome to some very special kids that are going to help us in the reading of today's scripture. So I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet in honor of God's word. And I'm going to invite Rudy Tot on down and Mrs. Mackenzie Portali. Give it up for our central kids. The Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs, needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a coat the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road for a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road for um, the crowds that went ahead of him and others that followed shouted. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Thank you so much. Good job. Okay, guys, how incredible is it? Our little little hearts here. We're so grateful. And something I love about Central, that we love our kids. So if you will, join me in prayer. And you can go ahead and have a seat. But let's pray. Jesus, we invite you into this space and into this room, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. God, we thank you that this morning, 2,000 years later, we're saying, Hosanna. God, that we are celebrating the gift of Jesus to humanity, and we 
Lord, thank you for that sacrifice. And Lord, we, I pray for my friends in this room that you have something for each one of them today that would strengthen their faith and encourage their heart. We thank you, Lord, for your truth. In your name we pray, amen. Well, hey, today our bottom line, our, our main thought is that Palm Sunday highlights Jesus as the king of the world, presenting us with the choice of passive observation or active participation, which is in response to this profound reality. So today, Christians all around the world are celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which we call Palm Sunday, because the crowd, as you saw in the video, welcomed welcomed him by waving palm branches and spreading their cloaks on the ground, because those who, who greeted him were convinced that he was the Messiah, the anointed one, sent by God to establish his kingdom here on earth. So I can't talk about this moment Uh, that we're reading in scripture, this triumphant entry into Jerusalem without first acknowledging the authority and kingship of Jesus Christ. The idea of Jesus as king of kings or lord of lords is seen all throughout scripture. We, We roll back all the way to when God first gives his name to Moses at Mount Sinai. God identifies himself in Exodus 22 as the Lord of Israel. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. The Lord is revealing his ultimate authority, his power, his presence, his authoritative word. God then frees the enslaved people of the Israelites. He gives them the Ten Commandments, ways to live, and he declares his lordship to Israel in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, where it says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The Old Testament establishes the authority of God As king of kings and lord of lords, Bible scholar John Frame further explains it this way, that God's power is absolute. That means it's beyond question. It transcends all other loyalties. And number three, it covers all areas of life with absolute wisdom. Authority is defined as the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. So I think, I think we have to acknowledge that we're wired to be in roles of authority, and we are oft, also wired to respond to authority. Although anymore these days, you hear the word authority, and you're like, <laughs> you're not going to enforce any obedience on me, right? It's kind of a sad place culturally we've come to. But reality is, there's a boss, a teacher, a coach, a family member, a mom, all right, I must confess, I, confess, I'm a because I said so mom. Any other parents because I said so, right, okay, <laughs> good, I'm not alone. But you can relate. And early on when my kids were little, I quickly fine-tuned my mom look, you know. They know you're going to be in trouble, son, if you do what you're about to do, and I'm giving you the look and you know it. <laughs> you should be scared. Yeah. I fine-tuned it, as many of you I'm sure have. Or then... Um, You know, in our house, too, we had the rule, I tell you once, the end. I'm not going to tell you five times not to do something. Probably because I was scarred because I went to this one parenting seminar, and they said, you don't have an opportunity to tell your kids five times to do something. If their ball rolls out in the middle of the street and a car's coming, you have one chance to tell them before they're hit by a car. So in my house, it's quickly, I told you once, son. I told you once, Elsie Bren. Um, All that to say is... Your parenting authority is to help your kid grow and learn and be the best version of themselves. And I think it's so cool of God because God has authority to fully exercise his power to enforce ultimate obedience in all of us. And yet, in his loving kindness, he sent his son Jesus to say, no, no. I love you so much, I'm going to give you a choice. I may know what's best for you, but I'm going to let you choose me. Man, I love that. 
uh, the Old Testament, they, it foretells of Jesus' arrival and kingship. You know, at Christmas time, we refer to Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Well, they say it again in, in uh, Zechariah 9, 9, the passage that is part of all the gospels which we're reading today. Zechariah 9, 9, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The passage is referenced in the gospels when Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And all throughout the New Testament, God is saying Jesus has absolute authority. We're one. God declares the authority of Jesus. It's even recorded in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that then at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. You know, we've been reviewing and studying the book of Romans. And Jesus comes to earth with this mission to save humanity in full authority, in full power that God has given him. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I have to pause because we have to highlight the contrast of expectations of how this King of Kings and Lord of Lords could have come to the earth. Number one, our King came to the earth, Jesus. He comes to the world with peace and gentleness and humility. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was the King of the world, I'd be like, I'm here. I have arrived. Bow, humble peasants. No, Jesus in peace. And in great love comes to humanity. The, the waving branches in his arrival are, are to declare his honor and, and honor him as a victorious leader. The chant itself, Hosanna, means save us now. So the people are acknowledging him. The significance of the palm branches and the cloaks are all signs to say Jesus is the king of Israel. The authority is upon him as God's son. Another irony Number two, Jesus, he rode a donkey. Kind of random to talk about a donkey right now, but it applies. And it's recorded in all four gospels that he came. His mode of transportation was listed. He rode a donkey. Has anyone ridden a donkey before? Side caveat. Yeah, maybe three of us. Cool. Yep. I know. I, so here's the thing. I'm from the Midwest. And we do some interesting creative things for fundraisers in the Midwest. So we had a thing called donkey basketball when I was growing up in high school. I, we have a picture of it. This is real. This is real. This is called donkey basketball. You got on teams. There's red team, blue team. You got your donkey. You know, they had a name. It was super fun. And some of those donkeys are terrors. And you played literally like a game of basketball trying to score in the other basket. And you're like, you know, you'd fall off your donkey. You had to wear helmets. See all these people wearing helmets. There's another picture too. And it, it's intense. But, man, donkeys are really challenging animals. Let me tell you, they're super interesting. So, you know, a couple interesting facts um, in regards to donkeys and horses. Horses, you know, because I was like, you know, God, why a donkey? Why would you pick a donkey? Um, but horses can be easily convinced to make movement when there's pressure, right? Horses have a flight mentality. If they're, if they're, if they're stressed or if, um, you know, there's a threat, they'll flee quickly. Those of you that have had some horseback riding lessons probably understand that, right? Nature provided... Horses with long legs and the ability to run quick and fast. Well, the cousin, the donkey, was not blessed with long legs and has rather short legs and a slow guy at gait. When the donkey senses a threat, he'll assess the situation and merely freeze. That's why donkeys are known for being stubborn. Um, you know, there's also a thing called the donkey minute where, you know, give a donkey minute because it'll just lock up and freeze and you're not moving that donkey. And let me tell you, like I would be moving my donkey trying to win this basketball donkey game. It would not move. It's super impressive and they're super strong and super stubborn. And um, so, yeah, I was asking myself, why a donkey? You know, and during this time period, people would have expected the king to come with a lot of pomp and circumstance 
some real elaborate display of power through their military entourage. You know, they're, they're thinking there's going to be a big money displayed, royalty. It's going to be elaborate and beautiful. All the horses that they're all coming in on, this military representation. That's what would be expected. But what we see here is that we serve an extraordinary God. God isn't going to be fit into our meager understanding. He doesn't have to posture himself. He doesn't have to show his great display of power to woo you, to impress you. He's not about it. That's not of his character. His humble display of character by riding on a donkey with peace and love and gentleness is a sign. His meekness is a sign of his strength and power. And, and God, God is so extraordinary. We see this pattern a lot. And a few I want to highlight today, you know, he doesn't respond how we think he's going to respond, right? We see this when, when he's even raised from the dead. At, you know, we talk about next week with Easter. The, the first people that he reveals himself are to women, right? And women at this time are commodities. They can be bought and sold. They're slavery. It, you know, it, it's... It, it, you wouldn't think he would reveal himself to women. Be like, no, go show, go show up. Show up and show off, God. Do your thing, Jesus. But he says, you know, I love women so much. I'm going to allow for them to be the first people I see. Because I love all my creations. I think that's so cool. He validates his beautiful creation in them as well. And then it makes sense how he responds to Pilate in John 18, 37, when he goes, in, goes to trial. Pilate says to him, so you're a king. And Jesus answers, well, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come to the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus doesn't have to posture himself to convince others of his power. He is the ultimate power. He is the great I am. 1 Timothy 16, 13 through 5, 15 says this. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. Because he's the giver of life. And of Jesus Christ who, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good, good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of Jesus Christ our Lord. Which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. The notion that Jesus is king radically implies that regardless of Jesus getting down to earth on behalf, of a, on behalf of a humble servant, there is no power above him. In other words, we understand that he has complete, unchallengeable control over everything after being risen by God from the grave. So in light of these observations, how do we respond? How do we respond? I think we can relate to the disciples' retelling of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But who are the participants? And I want to examine, examine that right now. The observing and the participating. Those that are observing and participating in Palm Sunday as we posture our hearts to worship Jesus this morning. So that first group, the observers. I kind of classify these in two areas, the skeptics and the critics. The critics I would identify as the, the Pharisees, as we see in Scripture. Now, here's a definition of a skeptic, so we're all on the same page. A person inclined to question or doubt accepted opinions. Matthew 21.10 is, is, is capturing some of the, the you know, the, what people are saying in the crowd when it says this. Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, and asked, who is this? So I envision this group of people, the skeptics, as the outliers. You know, the ones that are observing, but but I'm not about to get crazy and throw my brand new cloak so a donkey can walk over it. You know, some of you guys getting a little crazy with those palm branches. Not sure what that's about. You know, you Christians, you're a little extra. I'm not, I'm not so sure I, I, I get everything that's going on there. And maybe we have some modern day skeptics and we can relate to that as well, right? Why do you attend church? It's your, only one of your days off. 
Why do you attend church? Don't you know it's Youth Sports Sunday? What's that about? Who is Jesus? You know what? You, you do you, but I may not agree with you. And maybe you've even been in a seat where you've answered those questions for somebody. All right, and then we have the critics, and I'm going to camp here longer a little bit today um, because I think Jesus really warned our heart to, to stay soft and to not be critics. The definition of a critic is a person who expresses an unfavorable opinion of something. The Pharisees capture it really well. They said to one another in John 12, 19, because they're ticked off. The crowd's loud. People are raving their branches. They're getting crazy. I mean, you know, it's bigger than a Taylor Swift concert. And it is intense. And here are the Pharisees. They say in John 12, 19, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the world has gone after him. Kind of like saying, people are starting to like him. We got to do something about it. This can't happen. Who does he think he is? The Pharisees at this time, they don't think Jesus was who he said he was. They openly opposed him. They were religious and held to the moral code of Judaism, but they didn't acknowledge the authority that Jesus had. Maybe you've been there or you know someone. They have a moral code of conduct, right? They would say they're a Christian, but their lives don't align with the truth of the word of God. And then... The Pharisees in Luke 19, 39, they go after Jesus. These critics, they get aggressive sometimes, right? I'm unhappy. I'm going to let you know that I'm unhappy. And that's what the Pharisees do. And it's recorded, Luke 19, 39, they go after Jesus. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Handle it. Jesus, handle these people. Rebuke them, right? Tell them to stop. And they want Jesus to rebuke his disciples for worshiping him, for acknowledging him as the ultimate authority. So they're responding, and they want his followers to be punished for that. Well, how can we be Pharisees today? How can we be critics? Maybe we criticize the body of believers. We're selfish in our faith. We're hypocritical. We compare For the critics and the skeptics, I propose the question, what if, what if, what if all of us decided to go all in and be fully active participants for this beautiful journey that Jesus has for you? Scripture says in John 10, 10, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life to the fullest. Your soul could be be complete and at rest. And man, what if, what if we continue to take that chance today and, and keep fighting to be participants in the crowd? And that's our second group of people, the participants. The participants were the disciples and the worshipers. You know, a disciple is defined as a personal follower of Jesus. I love that verbiage, personal. <clears throat> Worship means a respectful devotion Loving, honoring, and obeying someone who deserves our highest regard. Worshiping God means acknowledging and celebrating his power in perfect gratitude. You know, I love having our our kiddos read this morning, and they did such a wonderful job. Because I think it's so cool that Jesus even acknowledges that the children have a desire to praise God, right? Right? The children participate in their purity and innocence. They're recognized they were in the presence of God. The next day in the temple courts, and I can just picture kids surra- <clears throat> surrounding Jesus, excuse me, and singing and chanting, and there's all this great energy. And the high priest and the teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, get a little upset about this. They get indignant hearing the kids. And that kind of, that upsets Jesus a little bit. I could see him being a little like, leave him alone, back off, critics. Matthew 21, 16 says this, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And those are red letter words in our Bible because that's what Jesus says. And then in Luke 19, 37 through 39, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully Joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So think about this moment for the disciples. At this point in their ministry and walking with Jesus, they've seen the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, Jesus walking on water, calming a storm, Lazarus being raised from the dead, and then they're staying in homeboy's house this week. The man healed from leprosy, the woman with the bleeding, two blind men, the deaf mute, the sick man at the pool of Bethesda, the boy with the demon. And these are only a few, a few of the list of miracles that are recorded, that the disciples record. So in this moment, can you blame them for being like, oh, I'm in it. I'm worshiping. I'm about it. I'm surrendered. This is happening. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So at this point in their ministry, when Jesus says, hey, guys, uh, go grab a donkey. It's tied up. Bring it to me. I'm going to use it. The disciples are obedient, and they do what their teacher asked of them. Yeah, sure, we'll get it, and we'll return it. Man, what, their participants, what miracles have you experienced in life that would lead you to declare Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then when the Pharisees, those critics, rebuke Jesus for the behavior of the disciples and their worship, Jesus responds. You know, he snaps back. He's going to correct the critics. He's going to correct the Pharisees. And he says this in, uh, in Luke 19, 40. I tell you, he replies, if they keep quiet... The stones will cry out. This is an inevitable response to the power and authority of Jesus Christ. If we don't respond, the stones and the rocks will cry out and everything will point to the authority and power of Jesus Christ. Man, how awesome is that? And I love the boldness of the participants recorded in this story of Palm Sunday. Throwing their cloaks down in honor of the presence of Jesus, chanting and cheering and singing, they had to physically respond in action to the presence of Jesus. Oh man, and when I was preparing this message, that was my prayer for my family and for us in this room as I cover each of you in prayer, that as disciples, disciplers, and disciples ourselves and worshipers of Jesus, that we would respond to him with eager adoration and service and praise. So in closing, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is the beginning of Holy Week. So I wanted to march down this real quick. Monday, Jesus curses the fig tree and he cleanses the temple. Tuesday, Jesus' authority is questioned, but Jesus continues to teach in the temple. Later that night, he's anointed in Bethany. Oh, and I love the story of the woman with the, with the perfume, and she breaks it and pours it over his feet in adoration and worship of his upcoming burial. Wednesday, the plot against Jesus is unraveling, and the scheming and the planning of the Pharisees and the high priests are happening. And Judas, it's believed that he decides to p- betray Jesus on that day. On Thursday, Jesus enjoys the Last Supper. And while he's at the Last Supper, surrounded by that table of those men, he's breaking bread with, he comforts them. He comforts the disciples. He then goes to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, Lord, take this cup from me. But if it's your will, Lord. And then later that night, Jesus is arrested and rushed through trial so that on Friday, which we say is Good Friday, but it wasn't good for Jesus. Jesus was beaten and whipped and flogged and crucified at Golgotha. And as a crowd looked on, and instead of this time saying Hosanna, they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. And then next Sunday, with millions of Christ followers all over the world, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hope of Easter, the grave can't hold the creator of the world, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and the ultimate power and authority. 
And today, this Palm Sunday, the kickoff of the week of the events that happened on Jesus' last, last week here on earth, my question for us is, what is your response to Jesus as the King of Kings? Are you an observer or a participant? Have we settled in some areas in our life we need to evaluate? So if you could, I'm going to invite you to respond in this moment. So if you could bow your head and close your eyes. <clears throat> Maybe you're someone in this room or online and you would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you don't know God. You're not actively participating in a relationship with him. It would be my honor to pray for you. And I invite you to raise your hand at this moment to see who I'm praying for.